The first season of House of the Dragon has come to an end, and has proven to be not only a worthy prequel to Game of Thrones, but one of the boldest and most ambitious shows I think I've ever seen. This season had the incredible pressure of attempting to win back a scarred fanbase after the events of season 8, and to do it with a totally new story that spans over decades, while swapping out main actors, introducing new characters, while still managing to maintain a coherent and immersive story. This should not have worked, yet they've managed to regain my investment in the franchise, and I've never been more happy to be wrong. Looks like the bastard's in love. Episode 6 takes place 10 years after Rhaenyra's nightmare of a wedding, and they pick the perfect way to show how much has changed since the last time we saw her. <laughs> We get an intense birthing scene showing a now adult Rhaenyra pushing out her third child and is forced to make the long, slow walk through the court after Queen Alicent requests to see the child immediately. She is accompanied by a now older Laenor who wasn't there during her labor and is trying his best to comfort her. It's interesting to see them go from the intimacy of a birthing scene directly into a walk through the Red Keep in front of dozens of nosy onlookers. A walk that ends with reintroducing us to Kristen Cole who is somehow still alive and working as Allison's personal protector. So we have to assume she intervened and spared his life, because I can't see Viserys letting him live after ruining such an important event. We get reintroduced to Allison, who has settled into her role as queen, enough to make these kinds of demands, but she also makes it clear that she didn't actually intend for Rhaenyra to come herself right after giving birth, but Rhaenyra decided to anyway. And the joy of seeing that Viserys is still alive, looking like an absolute zombie, Missing an arm, but still all smiles at the sight of his new grandson. Viserys says the baby has his father's nose, highlighting his willful ignorance of the situation, while Alicent has a totally different approach. Do keep trying, Selena. Sooner or later you may get one who looks like you. Rhaenyra's two sons are introduced, Juceris and Luceris, or Jason Luke for short, and are excited to pick out a dragon egg for their baby brother. And we get the impression that Harwin Strong is clearly her lover, and the father of her kids, something that they set up very subtly in the first few episodes. And I find it amazing that a drunk and angered Viserys mocked the idea of matching these two way back in episode 3, when he assumed that Lyna was going to suggest it. And it turns out, yeah, they would have been a great match, they look pretty chill right now. Lenor sends the boys back to resume their lessons in the dragon pit, where we see Alicent and Rhaenyra's children are learning to train their dragons together, and we get a clear hint of things to come and how truly difficult it is to control them. Aemond, Alicent's younger son, is the only one whose dragon egg didn't hatch, something they decide to ruthlessly mock him for, and they waste no time in showing how much it affects him as he sneaks down into the dragon's lair, almost getting himself killed. They show several scenes in a row with Alicent to help highlight the family dynamic as she tries to bond and understand her strange, bug-obsessed daughter, scolding Aemon for his obsession with dragons as this is not the first time he's tried to sneak down there trying to get Viserys to admit the truth about Rhaenyra, saying having one bastard is a mistake, but having three is an insult, and she's surprised their dragon eggs even hatched, and then finally walking in on her eldest son Aegon, masturbating over King's Landing. And rather than being shocked at such a sight, she yells at him for his prank on Aemon and warns him of things to come. You are the challenge! You are the challenge, Aegon! Simply by living and breathing! Otto's words in the last 10 years have clearly taken their toll on Alicent, and just like Otto failed to understand her, she's repeating the cycle with her own children, using them as political pieces, rather than actually working on them as people. The same mistake that Tywin and Cersei will eventually make. I am Queen Regent, not some brood man. You're my daughter! You will do as I command, and you will marry Loras Tyrell. We finally get caught up with Daemon, who was settled down with Lena Velaryon and had two daughters, Reyna and Bela. Lena got all the intel she needed from her conversation years ago with Viserys to track down and tame the mighty Vagar, the largest living dragon, and Daemon won a duel against the Provosi man she was engaged to in order to free her up to marry him, and they traveled the world together on the dragons before settling down to have kids, an adventure that could have had its own show, reminding us of just how much time we've actually skipped. They are living in Pentos, trying to enjoy the simple life, but Lena wants her kids to grow up in Driftmark and she wants to die a dragon rider's death rather than just being a comfy lord. Damon claims to want nothing to do with Westeros or the drama of their families, but he's also restless and not passionate about Pentos according to Lena, compared to King's Landing where he would roam the streets and party with the common folk. You get the sense of both of them trying to achieve some kind of happiness here but not quite on the same page, which leads us into the next scene 
where we see the boys learning to fight and the subtle way that Cole neglects Rhaenyra's children, focusing his attention much more on the two elder boys, something that Harwin Strong seems to notice. Seems the younger boys could do better with a bit of your attention, Sir Kristen. Cole puts Allison's son Aegon up against Rhaenyra's son Jace and pressures him to be aggressive for the sole purpose of exposing Harwin. Press him backward! Both with him! Stay on the attack! Use your feet! And after egging him on, Harwin snaps and punches him in the face. Cole is beaten but victorious as he smiles knowing what he just did made it impossible for anyone to deny the truth about his relationship with Rhaenyra and is a perfect scene to characterize the new Cole and his twisted sense of honor. Rhaenyra uses the hidden passages to eavesdrop on Lionel and Harwin, one of the best scenes to highlight the strengths of the side characters as not only is the acting fantastic but both of their perspectives are understandable and in line with their characters considering the tiny amount of time we've had with them so far. Don't play the fool with me boy. Your intimacy with the Princess Rhaenyra is an offence that would mean exile and death. The willful blindness of a father towards his child. I wish my father affected a similar blindness. Have I not? These many years. And yet today, you publicly assaulted a knight of the King's Heart in the, the defence of your- We get a conversation with Rhaenyra and Lenor and get a sense of what the last 10 years have been like. And clearly their master plan on the beach didn't work out, quite as expected. As he misses the thrill of war and travel, while Rhaenyra is trying to explain to him that they've been exposed after the incident with Harwin. And we also get a council scene to show what her relationship with Alison has become, as they openly bicker in front of the rest of the council. And since it's between the queen and the heir to the Iron Throne, nobody is able to intervene to cut the tension as they clearly despise each other. They mention that there's war in the step zones again after they fail to properly claim the territory after Damon's victory. And we see the old Grand Maester has passed away. The one who insisted on leeches. I wonder if this new guy is the sole reason that Viserys is still alive as he was the only one suggesting alternatives. In an attempt to make peace after seeing how truly far the relationship has fallen, Rhaenyra offers to marry her son to Alicent's daughter and unite the houses for good. Something Viserys is thrilled to hear, but Alicent scoffs at the idea wanting no part in it, even after Rhaenyra tries to sweeten the deal by offering fresh dragon eggs. But the best part of the scene is definitely Lionel's face as he clearly feels the pressure of this moment. A pressure he succumbs to and asks the king to resign his hand. Viserys isn't having it and refuses to let him quit without explaining why. And Lionel asks him to at least let him take Harwin back home to take his seat at Harrenhal and assume his duties as heir, knowing how dangerous this game has gotten for him. Alicent is furious and makes her decision perfectly clear about the marriage offer. I need to marry my only daughter to one of her plain featured sons. Then we see her having dinner with Lara Strong, Lionel's youngest son, and venting her frustrations finally admitting how much she misses her father, something that seems to intrigue him. And not only is he clever enough to pick up on the subtext and everything Alicent says, he's also ruthless when it comes to his goals, as we see him recruiting men from death row in exchange for their tongues. And then we see Damon in the same situation as Viserys, with Lena unable to deliver the baby, and the maester discussing options with him. And almost as if he's learned from his brother's mistake, we get the scene of him saying no, right as she leaves the room to make the choice herself and die her way. And we get to see a sad and reluctant Vagar kill her own rider as Damon arrives just in time to see it happen. And the sadness continues as Harwin prepares to leave, and you see how much of a father figure he is to the boys, and just how hard this is for everyone. And you can't help but feel bad for these boys, who not only have someone they love taken away from them, but are now forced to leave their home and move to Dragonstone all because of the situation they were born into. And the episode ends with a demonic speech from Laris, one of the most twisted descriptions of family I've ever heard, as he explains that love is a downfall, and they show a series of clips that relate to that, starting with Lionel and Harwin being burnt alive, thanks to Laris' assassins, Viserys staring at Ama's ring, still living with the guilt of his decision, and then Damon and his traumatized daughters after they lost Lena to childbirth. Loris kills his father and brother to further both in he and Alicent's positions, and Alicent is horrified, claiming she didn't want any of this. But Loris reassures her that she'll thank him soon enough. I assume you will write to your father now? Episode 7 begins with a somber tone for Lena Valarian's funeral, everyone together for the first time in years. Her uncle Vaiman delivers a speech as her casket is dropped into the ocean. He mentions the purity of Valerian blood repeatedly as he stares at Jace and Luke. 
and Damon laughs, seemingly offended by Veyman bringing up politics at a time like this. Rhaenyra tells Jace to go comfort his cousins, and he says that they should be mourning Lionel and Harwin, and he has an equal claim to sympathy. And again, you just can't help but feel sorry for them, as not only has he lost a loved one, but he has to hide it while also being shamed for it. Yet, he still sucks it up and does the right thing, and it's returned with kindness from his cousins. We see an anxious Viserys, eager to get a chance to talk to Daemon for the first time in years, and you can just tell that he wants to make up with his brother while he still can, after everything they've been through. And we get a fantastic scene with Alicent's children that does such a good job of fleshing out their characters. We have nothing in common. She's our sister. You marry her then. I would perform my duty, if mother had only betrothed us. <laughs> if only. It would strengthen the family, keep our Valyrian blood pure. She's an idiot. She's your future queen. You get the sense that Aemon, even though he's the younger brother, understands the bigger picture and is much more politically savvy than Aegon who just wants to party. Corlys tries to explain to his grandson Luke how important his legacy is and that he was born to inherit Driftmark. And for the first time, possibly in the history of Westeros, someone points out that if they inherit it means that they have to lose people and he doesn't want that. Everyone is so caught up in succession and birthright that they forget to actually be humans. And it takes the honest words of a child to remind us of that. This entire situation is just sad, as you see Jace and Aemon almost have a moment to bond, but the rift between the two families is too strong at this point, and they are unable to find the words. Viserys finally musters the courage to talk to Daemon, and tries to get him to come home, even offering him a seat on his council. He just wants to put the past behind and be a family again. But Daemon is too stubborn to accept, while also being unable to look his brother in the eye and clearly hates to see him like this. I get the sense that he's not sure exactly what he wants, but he knows that he doesn't want it handed to him, but he still loves his brother, an incredibly complex relationship that Damon has a hard time dealing with. Your girls are the very image of their mother, a comfort and an anguish, as I well remember. Viserys mistakenly calls Alicent Ama as he's going to bed, and I can see how it would be easy to look at this and just think he's losing his mind, which may be true, but it's more than that. If you remember the last scene, he was practically crying while looking at Ama's ring, as she was his one true love and this relationship with Alicent is bullshit, even though it was supposed to be for love, but thanks to Otto's manipulation, this is what's become of him. We get an intimate scene with Rhaenys and Corlys, and they make their position very clear, as Rhaenys wants to have Driftmark pass to Lena's children, even though that would undermine Rhaenyra's, and Corlys reveals his true feelings. History doesn't remember blood, it remembers names and he has chosen blind ignorance just like Viserys, it's too late for anything else. Rhaenyra and Daemon finally get a chance to catch up after they both lost their partners, and it only makes sense that they would pursue this opportunity to unite. Not only does she need allies, but she's always wanted him. And the one thing that I know Daemon wants for sure is, is a strong Targaryen house. I believe him when he said he wanted to be there for Viserys to protect him, and he would have never betrayed him. And they finished what they started all those years ago in the brothel, with sex on the beach. While Aemon... That sneaky little bastard creeps up to Vagar while she's sleeping and tries to climb up. Nobody likes being woken up, especially an ancient dragon. So after he tries again, she gets ready to roast him. But Aemon stands his ground and manages to calm the giant beast and climb his way up to her saddle. I don't speak dragon, but I get the sense that she was impressed by this and willing to give him a chance after he passed the smell test. which leads to a glorious scene of Aemon's first flight, almost getting himself killed trying to claim a dragon. Rhaenyra and Daemon watch from the beach, eager to know who's riding her, both understanding the significance of this event, while Bela and Reyna wake up Jason Luke when they see Vagar is missing. Then Aemon, full of adrenaline and confidence after finally getting a dragon, makes his way back only to be confronted by the group of them. It's him. It's me. Vagar is my mother's dragon. Your mother's dead. Vega has a new rider now. She was mine to claim. Then you should have claimed her. Maybe your cousins can find you a pig to ride. It would suit you. Aemon, being well trained and a few years older, manages to hold his own 1v4. Even after a knife is pulled out, he has the skill and the composure to handle the situation. But a single moment of enjoying the power he had over them gave the strong boys the chance to fight back and hit him with the pocket sand. The best kids fight I've ever seen. All of it was set up perfectly, the girl's reaction to Aemon's arrogance, the noble strong boys working together trying to do the right thing, the subtle escalation of the fight into a bloody end. They managed to make a boss fight with children, the scene is just fantastic. 
and the poor Lord Commander. He takes two minutes away from these kids to take a piss and he comes back to them trying to kill each other. And I immediately think back to the funeral scene and how much of this would have been avoided had the two boys found a way to bond in that moment and open up to each other. All hell breaks loose when Allison arrives to see her child is missing an eye and Rhaenyra sees her son's bloodied faces. Viserys is outraged the Kingsguard could let this happen under their watch and we get a look of horror from Alicent when the maester confirms the eye is gone and a shocked and frustrated Viserys looks down as he knows what this may mean for his future. Jace whispers to his mother that he called them bastards, something that she doesn't hesitate to bring up, claiming the legitimacy of her son's births was called into question and she refers to it as the highest of treason, seemingly trying to get Alicent killed, who simply counters with over an insult. My son has lost an eye. Viserys questions Aemon, and he passes the blame onto his brother in order to protect Alicent. And Aegon, the one person who truly doesn't care about any of this, is the only one willing to tell the truth. That everyone knows. Just look at them. A comment that Viserys has no answer for as he looks back at the rest of the room. He insists that they are a family, and they need to stop this infighting. But at this point, he's the only one that feels that way. The lines have been drawn and the poison from the parents has been passed on to the kids. As Viserys tries to calm the room, but there's no decision he can make that would please both sides. An amazing callback to when Robert was in a similar situation with the Starks and the Lannisters at each other's throats. Not Lady. Lady didn't bite anyone. She's good. Lady wasn't there. He makes it perfectly clear that anyone who voices doubts about their birthright will have their tongues cut out. A desperate attempt to keep the peace within the family. Your father, your grandsire, your king demands it! Once again leaving Alicent in limbo, the one person who has followed the rules and done her duty, and still has to suffer at the hands of others. Even the maiming of her baby boy is something she can't have justice for. So she snaps, grabbing Viserys' dagger and lunging at a terrified Luke. And before we continue, can we pour one out for the Lord Commander's blood pressure? What an awful shift. First the kids he's sworn to protect try to kill each other, and now the queen and the heir to the throne are in a knife fight. All he can do at this point is panic and say, stay back, nobody touch either of them. We all knew this relationship would be damaged, but I never imagined this kind of dynamic so soon. Exhausting, wasn't it? Hiding beneath the cloak of your own righteousness. The scene ends with Alicent viciously cutting Rhaenyra's arm as Daemon holds back Cole, a rivalry that's also been developing since the beginning. And young Aemon cements himself as the MVP of this episode, explaining it was a fair trade. He may have lost an eye, but he gained a dragon. A fact that majority of the room wasn't even aware of yet, as we get a reaction shot from Otto, who must be so insanely proud of his grandson. Eamon just made one of the most important decisions in his family's history. He wasn't ordered to, he just took his destiny into his own hands. And now, the room full of people reacting to the situation with the children finally understand the big picture. That Vagar, the largest and most experienced of all the dragons, has been claimed by the other side. And Lenor who has been a complete wreck since his sister's death, wasn't even around to see the drama unfold. He apologizes to Rhaenyra and vows to devote himself to her and their family. And we find out at the very least they did try to have kids. It wasn't just blatant disrespect. And just like with Luke, you can't help but feel sorry for Lenor, who has been slowly worn down by living this lie and unable to be himself. In fact, the only time he's shown any agency was insisting the child be named after Joffrey, his boyfriend that was killed at the wedding. Alicent is once again approached by Laris, and after seemingly being repulsed by him, she has now warmed up to the idea of having him around, understanding how ruthless the path forward may be. Rhaenyra admits to Daemon that she can't beat the Greens on her own, and convinces him that they are much stronger together. But he reminds her that Laenor would have to die in order for that to happen, something that she's totally on board with. So we see their plan put into action as they fake Leonor's death, leaving a burnt corpse for his parents to find, right after saying goodbye to their daughter. How did you let this happen? No. Am I fucking old? Tell me! Leonor leaves his name and family behind. He shaves his head and leaves with his boyfriend like he wanted. The only ones in Westeros to ever have a happy ending. The same escape that Cole offered to Rhaenyra so many years ago, she now grants to Leonor. And the episode ends with Rhaenyra and Daemon having a ritualistic wedding in front of their four children, who could not be more confused. Episode 8 takes place six years later, and we find out that after the death of his children, Corlys went back to war in the Stepstone, and has been severely injured in battle, and the chances of him dying are great enough to warrant a conversation about succession. 
as his younger brother Vaemon makes his claim for the throne. We get an incredible shot above Dragonstone, and we see Daemon free climbing in order to retrieve the new dragon eggs. One of the only times you see him genuinely happy, knowing that his babies will have eggs in their cradles and the further strengthening of their house. He receives a raven from his daughter Bela, who has been living on Driftmark with Rhaenys, warning him of Vaemon's plan. We see a now older Luke practicing his High Valerian. From the very beginning, this young man has understood just how much harder he's going to have to work in order to be taken seriously because of his position. Killed. Felled. It is a related word. Damon arrives to tell Rhaenyra the news, and the couple immediately make sail for King's Landing. And just like what happened to Viserys, they are greeted with silence rather than a royal welcome. And they notice right away just how much has changed in King's Landing. As all the Targaryen symbolism has been replaced with the Seven, a sign that the High Towers are truly in power. The Lord Commander interrupts the meeting to inform them that Rhaenyra and Daemon have arrived, and we find out that it was Otto who arranged for their special greeting. We see that Viserys' model city is covered in cobwebs. His passion project has been abandoned as Rhaenyra and Daemon make their way into the room, just to find what's left of him. Viserys is practically a corpse, barely holding on, and you immediately see how much it hurts for both of them to see him like this. Daemon is barely able to look at him, and instead of addressing this reality, he tries to go right into business and tells him that he needs to reaffirm his claim for Luke as the heir to Driftmark. And after seeing how delirious her father is, Rhaenyra stops the talk of politics and instead introduces him to their new sons, Aegon and Viserys. He gets a brief moment to appreciate his grandkids before succumbing to the pain, and Daemon quickly gives him his medicine before taking a whiff of the glass himself confirming his suspicions that they are keeping him drugged in order to rule themselves. We get an intense scene with Alicent that perfectly highlights what her life has become. After her scumbag son raped a maid, and she now has to cover for him. I asked him to stop, your guys. <laughs> Truly. She consoles the girl after listening to her version of the events, and tells her that it wasn't her fault, but then warns her of the dangers of letting this information get out right before paying her off and pouring a cup of moon tea to make sure there's no unwanted consequences. <coughs> the same person who lectured Rhaenyra for messing around is now covering for even worse actions from her son. She wakes him up to confront him, and this piece of shit barely remembers even doing it. What is it? What is it? What is it? What is it? That's all you can say for yourself. <laughs> And Aegon finally breaks down, saying how hard he tries and how he's never good enough for them. Right before Helena walks in, looking for the same maid as she was supposed to watch their children. And Alicent can do nothing but hug her daughter as there's no way to explain this situation. She goes right from family drama into political drama as she greets Damon and Rhaenyra. And she sees the scar from where she cut her, a reminder of their last meeting. They are both convinced that the Hightower is a drug in Viserys in order to take control, but Alicent insists that's not true and that he needs it for the pain. And she informs them that she and the Hand will be overseeing the council tomorrow since Viserys is not able to. We get reintroduced to her son Aemond as he trains with Kristen Cole, and even with just one eye, he managed to grow up to be an excellent fighter. Go down, my prince. You win in twenties in no time. I don't give a shit about Tawnies. Where the fuck did they find this guy? It's perfect. Nephews? Have you come to train? Even though they took his eye, it's almost as if they're more affected by that event than he was. Another fantastic recast. Vaemon Velaryon makes his entrance into King's Landing, and we see him take counsel with the High Towers. And Otto is obviously in favor of Vaemon, as securing him as an ally means securing the Driftmark fleet. Alicent is uneasy about the whole thing, considering Corliss might live, but she agrees with their logic and is ultimately pressured into it. She may be the queen, but she still feels powerless in all these situations. In an act of desperation, Rhaenyra offers to join houses with Rhaenys and marry her two sons to her granddaughters, but Rhaenys is still suspicious of her killing Laenor and wants nothing to do with her. Rhaenyra has no allies and is running out of time, so we see her try to talk to her father and confirm if what he said about Aegon's dream is true and we finally see her confess that the burden is too great for her to carry. But it's way too late for that. He named her heir and she now needs him to fight for her cause. Viserys is way too delirious to reply, only managing to utter the words, Rhaenyra, my only child. 
We see him get bandaged up the next morning and get a clear view of the awful state he's in. Otto insists that he takes his medicine, but he refuses, wanting to keep his mind clear. And he asks Otto to plan a dinner as he wants to have his whole family together. So the council for the succession of Driftmark begins as Otto takes his place on the throne. And Vaymond is the first to make his case. And after he mentions the purity of his blood, Rhaenyra interrupts, only to be scolded by Alison to wait her turn. This is about the future and survival of my house, not yours. And after taking more shots at her children, he stakes his claim as his brother's heir. And we see Luke is relieved while Rhaenyra is trembling, furious at the thought of the ramifications of this. And as she begins to make her speech, the door is open and Viserys fights through the pain to make one of the greatest entrances of all time. There are so many ways to display the strength of a character, but very rarely do you get a portrayal this unique. Everything this means for him and his family, every agonizing step, an entrance that demands the attention of the audience in the scene and in real life. And it's just a sign of the level of the writing in the show, that a man walking across the room could be the greatest moment of the season. We get a shot of Rainey's face, wondering if she could have done this after seeing what ruling has done to him. They show Rhaenyra in complete shock of what her father is doing. They show Damon grimacing at the sight of his brother in pain. And after refusing any assistance, Damon helps him make the final steps to the throne and places the crown on his head. An incredibly meaningful moment when you consider the history between these two. And Viserys immediately goes into king mode, saying that he doesn't understand why there's a succession when the matter is already solved. And the only person who could possibly know how Corlys currently feels about the situation is the Princess Rhaenys. So she goes from being on the sidelines to literally having the most important vote. And after everything she just witnessed, she makes her decision on the spot and decides to stick with Rhaenyra and accepts the generous offer that she made when she was desperate to marry her sons to Rhaenys' granddaughters. And as she speaks, you get a tiny shot of Lucerys' jaw dropping as he wants no part in this. And you see Vaemon glaring at her, understanding what this means. And Viserys says it's settled and reaffirms his position. And with this one decision, Vaemon loses everything. Not only does he lose the chance to be the heir to Driftmark, but this will essentially be the end of his line. So he makes a final outburst and you get a shot of Damon smirking in the back, understanding where this will go. He snaps, declaring Rhaenyra's children are not true Valarians. And Viserys reminds him those are his grandsons. And he's no more than a second son. Her children are bastards! And she is a whore. I will have your tongue for that. And for the second time in this scene, we see Viserys and Damon united. Where Viserys, even in this current state, wants to do the deed himself. Even though he said this in episode one. You could have the ruffian's tongue for that. Tongues will not change the succession. Let them wag. Which may have been true at the time, but when it comes to his family, he clearly doesn't fuck around. And Damon reminds us just how sharp Valerian Steel is, and his approach to dealing with disrespect to his house. He can keep his tongue. Rest in peace, you brave, brave man. All the commotion makes Viserys dizzy, and Alicent rushes to his aid, pleading with him to take his medication. But he says he doesn't want to cloud his mind, and he has to put things right first. And as he leaves, we get a shot of Rhaenyra, seeing for the first time that Alicent was telling the truth, and is actually trying to help him. Rhaenys is now mourning the third family member this season. And considering how little screen time she's had, they've managed to make her not only an interesting character, but a sympathetic one. And I can't wait to see where her story goes from here. The whole family is gathered together for dinner, just like Viserys planned. And Alison starts it off with one of her prayers. And as she mentions Vaemon Valarian, you get a shot of Damon laughing and Otto shaking his head in disappointment, as nothing has gone right for him today. Viserys says that this is a day for celebration congratulating his grandsons on their engagement and how happy he is to see all his loved ones together, but how much it pains him to see how much they've grown apart. He removes his mask, wanting them all to see the real him, what he's become, and he passionately pleads with his family to stop the infighting. The only way to maintain a strong house is to stay united. His speech manages to strike a chord with the adults who know him best, especially Rhaenyra, who knows that his words are motivated by much more than just family. So she makes the most genuine praise of Alicent she can muster, 
claiming that nobody has been more faithful or taken better care of her father than she has. And Alicent, embracing this rare moment of kindness, raises her glass to Rhaenyra and her house, claiming that she will make a fine queen. They all raise their cups and enjoy a moment of peace. Interrupted by Aegon being a complete cunt, the only person in the room not remotely affected by Viserys' beautiful speech. You ever wish to know what it is to be well satisfied? All you have to do is ask. Jace loses his temper after the taunting. But just like at the funeral, we see that Jace is wise enough to hold back his personal feelings and give the most genuine compliment to his uncles he could muster, reminding them of the time that they shared together as kids, hoping to rekindle that in the future. Helena finally says a coherent sentence and does a toast to just how shit Aegon is as a husband. And to add salt in the wound, Jace asks her to dance just to piss him off. The music is playing and the food is flowing in, and Viserys finally gets a chance to see genuine happiness and peace in his family. He has fought so hard for this moment, and as soon as he feels like he has done as much as he can do, the pain returns and he is forced to return to bed. And we get several shots of panic and heartbreak from Daemon, knowing that this may have been his last chance to speak to him. And as Viserys is being taken out, the pig is being brought in, and just happens to be placed right in front of Aemond, who is still salty about that joke from years ago. A reminder of why you never tease the crazy kid. Luke chuckles, obviously reminded of that day. But Aemon decides to give a speech of his own. Final tribute. And praises nephews. Each of them wise, handsome, strong. Amen, you son of a bitch. You fucked up Viserys' dinner plans. Another reminder of how little his speech meant to his sons, as they've barely had any time to bond with him, as he's been falling apart their entire lives. Aemon smiles after being punched in the face by Jace, and shoves him to the floor as Aegon pins Luke down. Daemon finally steps in and ends the fight with a wave of a finger, sending the boys out of the room, and he gives Aemon the stare down. There was nobody more impressed by Vaemon's decapitation than Aemon was, so he backs down and leaves. But you still get the sense of mutual respect nonetheless. And the episode ends with a moaning and delirious Viserys taking his medicine from Allison, but under the impression that he's speaking to Rhaenyra. And he answers the question that she asked him earlier, whether or not he believed Aegon's dream to be true. The only dream that Allison knows about was the dream that he told her about a son named Aegon wearing the Conqueror's crown, and assumes that that's the dream he's referring to. And she makes the massive mistake of interpreting Viserys' dying wish as putting Aegon on the throne. I understand, my king. And with that, Viserys finally stops fighting. And his last words are my love, as he never stopped thinking about Emma, and has been slowly dying since that moment. The perfect ending to one of the most meaningful arcs I've seen in years. I, I, I did not decide to name Rhaenyra my heir on a whim. All the lords of the kingdom would do well to remember that. Episode 9 starts with a somber tone after the death of the king. Alison is informed by her handmaiden and is brought to tears. A scene that should shed any doubt from anyone who didn't think that she cared about him. We see her inform Otto of the news and mentioning his final words. And even Otto seems to have a brief moment of mourning before getting down to business. And after being told not to say anything, we see Talia, Alison's handmaiden, sending messages from the Red Keep. We get a council scene to announce his death. And it warms my heart that he will be remembered as Viserys the Peaceful, a hard-earned title. And Otto announces the king's dying wish. And without skipping a beat, they go right into discussion of crowning Aegon. And they reveal they've been plotting behind Alicent's back the entire time. And after watching just how quickly the council has been overthrown, Lord Beesbury, the master of coin, has had enough. And he speaks up, reminding them that he has known Viserys longer than any of them. And he refuses to believe that he would do this. The king was well last night. By all accounts, which of you here can swear that he died of his own accord? Whether it was one of you or all of you, I care not. I will have no Sit part down! of you. What the fuck? Of all the ways you could have killed him, you chose this? This is almost as stupid as Kyburn's death. Obey your queen, Sir Gregor. Beesbury got done dirty, he deserved better than this. And Kristen Cole is a lost soul. I love the idea of him having a new twisted sense of honor after the time skip. But that doesn't include this. His outburst at the wedding was actually understandable considering his mind state, but this just doesn't make any sense. 
So I really hope that they're not turning him from a complex character to just a mad dog that they throw at problems. They leave his body there and go right back to business. Tylen Lannister begins to discuss securing Storm's End and mentioning that Lord Baratheon has four daughters. And Alicent cuts him off to ask what about Rhaenyra, the one topic that everyone seems to be avoiding. And she puts together pretty quickly that they intend to kill her. Otto and the council try to convince her it's a sacrifice they must make. And she pleads that this is not what Viserys would want. But the king did not wish for the murder of his daughter. He loved her. I will not have you deny this. And yet... One more word and I will have you removed from this chamber and sent to the wall. Tyland, in an attempt to be reasonable, asks her what does she think we should do. And before she can even reply, Otto orders the Lord Commander to do the deed. Take your knights to Dragonstone. Be quick and be clean. But this honorable man refuses, removes his cloak, and leaves, claiming he only takes orders from the king. And after confirming that Aegon is not in his chambers, Alicent and Otto race to find him, with Otto sending Eric and Arik, the Kingsguard twins, and Alicent sending Cole and Aemon to track him down. And while the two teams search the city for Aegon, Otto calls all the lords present in King's Landing and demands that they pledge their allegiance to Aegon, pressuring them to kneel and killing those who stay faithful to Rhaenyra. We see the twins entering a child's fighting club, and Eric explains that Aegon is a regular here, and he even has some of his bastard children living there, everything he could do to show his brother that Aegon isn't fit to rule. And on the other side, we have Aemon, frustrated to be looking through the streets for his ungrateful brother. It is I, the younger brother, who studies history and philosophy. It is I who trains with the sword, who rides the largest dragon in the world. It is I who should be... A rare humanizing moment for Aegon that allows us to get some more insight into his frustration and how much better fit he is to rule. But the curse of the second son is strong in Westeros. Whether it's Tyrion, Stannis, Vaemon, Daemon, or even Aemon, frustration with their position is something they all seem to have in common. Alicent goes to speak to Rhaenys, who's been locked in her room this entire time, and demands to know the meaning of this. She informs her that the king is dead and she came to ask for her support reminding her of everything she has lost by dealing with Rhaenyra, even going so far as to claim she should have been queen over Viserys. But Rhaenys remains indecisive. The twins discover that Masaria the Spymaster has Aegon and wants to speak to the Hand of the King directly. Now let me take this time to say that this woman has the worst accent I've ever heard in my life. I don't know what this is or who approved of this god-awful attempt and I will spare you any clips of her voice, don't worry. She reveals his location in exchange for Otto promising to close down the fighting pits so no more children get hurt. Cole and Aemon manage to track them and cut them off after retrieving Aegon. And Eric abandons his brother wanting no part in putting Aegon on the throne. And Aegon pleads with his brother, begging to let him disappear, an option that seems to appeal to Aemon for a brief moment. But instead he's dragged back, kicking and screaming like a child. And my mind immediately runs to all the people who went through hell just for a chance to get the throne, sacrificing their own humanity. And we have this ungrateful piece of shit with no understanding of how blessed he is. At the same time, he's the only person voicing how unsuitable he is to rule. He's actually a very complex character when you examine his actions, but it's just very hard to appreciate when he's such a monster. Otto congratulates Alicent on winning the race, and she finally calls him out for his manipulation over all these years. And now that she has Aegon, she will decide how to proceed, and details the plans for Aegon's coronation, and says that they will send respectful terms for Rhaenyra, asserting her power over him for the very first time. And in the very next scene, she reminds us of just how far she's fallen, and what she's willing to do to get information, as she meets Lord Strong, her personal spy. This entire time I've viewed Laris as a ruthless, calculated individual, a man with great ambition, and a perspective on family that's almost terrifying. A man whose master plan will be revealed in the most- Okay, never mind. All this is about feet. He wants to eat her toe jam. He wants her to wiggle her big toe. He wants to jerk off to her royal heels. Uh, it's not that this doesn't make any sense or suit the character. It's simply a question of why. Why did you choose to ruin his mystique by making him the creepy footman? You could have done anything, yet you go out of your way to undermine his presence to this degree? 
The mystery has been completely ruined, and he is now just the foot guy. Rest in peace, Lionel and Harwin. I hope they know they die at horrible deaths, just so this creeper can whack at defeat. I truly hope that they find a way to make this work, but this wouldn't have been my choice. He informs her about the spies in the Red Keep, and assures her that he will handle it, and ends up burning down Masaria's palace, something that Allison is now fine with. Rainies is escorted out of her room by Eric, who seems to be abandoning his position. She pleads with him to let her get to the dragon pit, and he says that they will be watching for her, it's impossible. He tries to get her to a ship, but they are cut off by the crowd of people being ordered to attend Aegon's coronation. And we see a depressed Aegon being escorted in a carriage by Alicent, who reminds him of how much has been done to give him this day. Thousands of people are hoarded into the Sept to begin the ceremony. And light his way to wisdom. He is blessed and anointed and presented the crown of the conqueror by the new Lord Commander, Kristen Cole, who was rewarded for popping Beesbury's head like a zit instead of being punished for his latest hate crime. He glances over to his siblings, who both hate him, and force themselves to bow, and then he turns and receives a standing ovation from the crowd, and Aegon soaks it all in, almost as if this is the first time he's ever experienced any kind of love. <laughs> Rainies burst out of the floor on her dragon in the middle of the crowd, potentially killing hundreds of people from the initial impact, the falling rocks, and filling the entire building with smoke. She makes her grand entrance, even though they said that she won't be able to get to the dragon pit. Yet somehow she has her armor and got her dragon anyway. And none of the greens run away. Everyone just stands there on the stage in shock. Rainies is in complete control. But instead of eliminating them, she spares them as if she's had a sudden change of heart and she can't bring herself to kill a mother. And I can't help but wonder how many mothers did she just kill when she blew up the room? And if she's ruthless enough to do that, why wouldn't she finish the job when you know how much more death is gonna come from them living? This scene was clearly designed just to give Rainies a powerful moment. And instead of doing it in a way that makes any sense, they pretty much ruin her character by making it a genocide. Did you not learn from what they did to Danny in season eight? When Cersei blew up the Sept in season six, not only was her back against the wall, it was in line with her character and a tactical decision that ultimately made her queen after the death of her son. Rainey's blowing up a room full of innocent people just to make a flashy entrance makes no sense and ruins all the sympathy I've built up for her over the season. I'm sure not everyone will agree with this. I'm sure there's people that loved it. The scene looked amazing, but it just doesn't make any sense for her character and I think it was a mistake. The final episode opens up with a young Lucerus looking at the table, pondering his future as the heir to Driftmark, pleading with his mother for the millionth time that he doesn't want it, claiming he gets seasick and isn't fit for the position. And Rhaenyra tells him just how afraid she was at his age, but she eventually learned that she had to earn her position and she will help him do the same. It's clear that unlike Alicent and Aegon, they have a loving relationship, but because of this system, the same pressure is being applied on him as he's complained about this for years. Rhaenys arrives and wastes no time at all and tells them that Viserys is dead and Aegon has been made king. She tells them that she refused their offer and witnessed the crowning of Aegon before she left. But she skips the part where she killed a bunch of people. That whore of a queen murdered my brother and stole his throne and you could have burnt them all for it. A war is like to be fought over this treachery to be sure. Mm. But that war is not mine to begin. I'm sorry, but how is this not a declaration of war? You already started it. I just don't get it. She warns them that the Greens are coming for Rhaenyra and her children, and the shock of the news sends Rhaenyra into an early labor, trying to force out her sixth child as Daemon hosts a war council. And Rhaenyra tells Jace to tell Daemon that no actions be taken without her consent, essentially pausing the plans he just made. But he sends the ravens anyway, and takes Jace outside for a lesson in loyalty where he tests the commitment of two Kingsguard who have come to serve under Rhaenyra. And we get another display of how much control Daemon has over his dragon, as he makes him appear on command and come over his shoulder to join him. And if you remember way back in episode 3 when they were fighting, it was like they shared the same mind, and when Daemon got hit with an arrow, Caraxes screamed out. So there's definitely varying degrees of connection with the dragons, as we see Cyrax, Rhaenyra's dragon, crying out in response to her labor pains. Rhaenyra is at war with her own body, trying to force the baby out, almost as if it's in the way and she has no time for this, 
and I'm immediately reminded of her mother saying that the child bed is our battlefield. And just like Daenerys in Game of Thrones, she gives birth to a stillborn, covered in scales with a tail. A tragic result to a brutal labor as we see Daemon enter the room as she cuddles the bloody body on the floor. They both have their separate scenes of mourning as Daemon breaks down on the beach and Rhaenyra wraps the body herself. She has just lost her throne, her father, and now her daughter as they hold a funeral for the baby. This is the lowest moment imaginable for her, and just when things couldn't get any more hopeless, the loyalty of one Kingsguard makes all the difference. As Eric arrives with Viserys' crown, Daemon holds it in his hand, knowing for the first time that his brother is truly gone, and he places it on Rhaenyra's head, just like he did with Viserys. And what started as a funeral becomes a coronation. Not the same grand spectacle that Aegon received, but something much more meaningful. She makes her first entrance as queen as they wait for- Whoa, whoa, whoa the table lights up? This whole time? How did Stannis and Daenerys not figure this out? You slackers. Rhaenyra enters the room and is introduced as queen for the first time. And after discussing soldiers and logistics, one of the lords says talk of soldiers is nonsense. When both of you have dragons, we should be using them. Daemon, essentially acting as battle commander, breaks down the number of dragon riders and suggests that since they have more than the greens, they should use them to surround King's Landing. And before she could reply, Eric announces that a boat has been sighted and the greens have arrived. And just like in episode 2, we see Daemon face off with Otto on the bridge. Except this time, Rhaenyra is on the other side. He begins listing Aegon's terms to Rhaenyra, offering everything they can to make peace. Otto reminds them of all the signs of legitimacy that Aegon has, and that stale oaves will not put Rhaenyra on the throne, and he gives her a message from Alicent as a sign of good faith, the same page that she ripped out in episode 1. Any hope of Rhaenyra accepting these terms rests in whatever remains of their friendship. But Daemon is ready to go to war, he's wanted Otto's head for years and he's had enough. But Rhaenyra needs more time to think, because just like Dany before she lost her mind, Rhaenyra doesn't want to rule over a kingdom of ash and bone, and that's exactly what happens when dragons go to war. And she raises the question of what's more important, peace in the realm or her on the throne. But Daemon snaps back, saying that's her father speaking, openly yelling at her and saying that the enemy has declared war and she needs to act, undermining her authority. So Rhaenyra asks for the rune to be cleared, and tells Daemon that her actions are much more than just about the war between the two houses, reminding him about the Song of Ice and Fire. But Daemon has no idea what she's talking about. He's in the north, the conqueror's dream. Sarah shared it with me when he named to me. <laughs> Daemon in this moment is seeing the same weakness he saw in his brother in her, and has no time for visions and dreams when they're at war. And he's also realizing for the first time that Viserys never truly trusted him to be heir. And Rhaenyra is confirming that Viserys was telling the truth and truly wanted her to rule. There's so much going on in this moment for these characters, but unfortunately the substance of this moment is ignored by many, even though this scene is ultimately a victory for Rhaenyra. And I find it very fascinating that the two times we see Daemon impulsively lose his temper both involve his relationship with his brother. I never told you. <laughs> Did you? We see Corlys has regained consciousness and awakens to the scornful eyes of Rhaenys, claiming he abandoned her, and after being informed of his brother's death, he admits heedless ambition has always been a Valyrian weakness, referring to both himself and his brother. As he pushed to have Rhaenys on the throne, he pushed to have Lena marry Viserys. He had his firstborn son marry Rhaenyra. All of these decisions made or approved of just to further his family legacy and look where it's got them. He says that he wants to retire back to Driftmark and not pick a side. But it's too late as Rhaenys explains the situation and their family is now tied to this war. So he decides to stick with Rhaenyra. And fortunately for them, his six years away wasn't wasted, as he now controls the Narrow Sea and they can cut off all trade to King's Landing. But in order for their plan to work, they need to secure the loyalty of the other houses first. And Jay suggests that she sends them, since dragons are faster and more convincing. And Luke wants no part in this as we can see from the look that he gives him. But Rhaenyra agrees as long as they go as messengers, not warriors. Now a lot of people consider this a stupid decision by Rhaenyra, putting her sons and her heirs at risk when they're so young and inexperienced. And the safer option would have definitely been to send Rhaenys as she is part Baratheon. But after having time to think about it, I still think it makes sense from a character perspective as she wants to give them the same opportunity to step up and prove themselves as she had in episode 2 when she retrieved the dragon egg. You have dragon riders, father. 
Send us. Jace and Luke both know they have to work harder to prove themselves, and arriving via Dragonback would be very convincing to anyone who doubts their position and is considering breaking their oaths. We get the honor and privilege of seeing Daemon interact with Vermithor, King Jaehaerys' dragon that's been in the pit for over 30 years. I get the sense that this isn't the first time that Daemon has done this and has been warming it up to the idea of taking a new rider. This thing is apparently the second largest and oldest after Vagar, and I can't wait to see what it looks like as all the dragons have been fantastic. Luke arrives at Storm's End and we get an amazing overhead shot of the fortress. And as he lands and approaches the front gate, Vagar stands up, towering over the castle to the surprise of both him and his dragon. Luke stands his ground and proceeds with his mission, and is greeted by Boris Baratheon, the son of the lord who kneeled to Rhaenyra, and Aemond, who arrived before he did, and offered to marry one of his daughters. Boris has no intention of keeping his father's oath and demands offerings, asking him which one of his daughters will he marry. But Luke is already engaged to marry his cousin Rhaena. He turns to leave after being denied, but is stopped by Aemon, revealing the sapphire he keeps under his eye patch, and demanding Luke cuts out his own. Eye for an eye, he says, but Boris shouts not in my hall, and orders his men to escort the boy back to his dragon. Luke sprints back to Arax, who is stressed out from the rain already, and he looks up to see the scariest sight imaginable. Vagar is missing. Which leads to essentially a Jaws scene in the sky where Erex and Luke are dwarfed by the mass of Vagar, Aemon is having the time of his life bullying his nephew, but Luke and his dragon are fleeing for their lives, and when he feels that his rider is being threatened, Erex counterattacks and hits Vagar with a blast of fire, disobeying Luke's orders, and I immediately think back to the words of Viserys, that the idea that we control the dragons is an illusion. We have already seen that the dragons are emotionally linked, so the fear of Luke and the bloodlust of Aemon is surely affecting them, and the dragons don't understand the political ramifications of the situation. So we see Vagar, the ancient battle-hardened dragon, getting attacked by essentially a child, and she ignores Aemon's commands and goes berserk. Luke clears the storm, and has a single moment of blissful peace before everything falls apart. And young Lucerys, the boy who wanted nothing to do with any of this, the boy who didn't want anyone to die, is the first one killed in the most brutal fashion. Aemon reveals a face of absolute horror, confirming that he didn't intend for it to go this far. And the season ends with Rhaenyra, after everything she did this episode to keep the peace, receiving the news that her son is dead. And we get a glorious death stare setting up the stage for season 2. What a great way to make sure everyone will be back for the next season. And as someone who thought this show was going to be Game of Thrones cosplay with dragons, this turned out to be such a pleasant surprise. They have a real understanding of all the elements that made Game of Thrones work in its prime. The focus on character and the blending of drama and fantasy. This is also a testament to world building, that they managed to recapture the gritty tone of Westeros, and have created a story that's breathed new life into the franchise. And of course nothing is ever perfect as I've had my fair share of issues along the way, but overall House of the Dragon has been a remarkable success. And considering the first review I ever did on this channel was on The Long Night, I felt like it was my duty to review this show since it managed to recapture some of the magic that was lost by that crime against humanity season 8. This script took ages to put together in an attempt to show respect that I think this show deserves. So please pass it along if you enjoyed the video and if you want to see any more media reviews you can find them on my channel. Thanks for watching, I'll see you all for season 2.